Hello, welcome students to this video about ancient Mesopotamia, the land of unpredictable rivers, gods, and city-states. Now the goal of these overview videos is just to get you some key vocabulary, give you a huge like big picture view of some major themes, and you can think of all this information as being primarily on the identification and description level, those uh, rather low and simple levels of understanding. And what these videos will be missing is primarily the details, the people, the places, the things that are very specific, um, and it's also missing a timeline of events because this is just a big broad brush overview. Speaking of which, here's the biggest and broadest of brushes, the big picture geography of Mesopotamia. So Mesopotamia refers to the land between these rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates, but really it kind of refers to this whole area here. And in particular, we're going to focus on this southern bit. You can see that this is called the Fertile Crescent. This is an area uh, where you could grow crops and we see the early development of civilizations. And it's also considered a cradle of civilization, because you can think of it as like civilizations, like a little baby is just developing down in there. And you can see that the modern day country of Iraq is what most of this area is covered by, but also some of Syria. And also it goes a little bit into Turkey with those rivers. And there's also Israel and Palestine that are over here, the part of the Fertile Crescent. It's a lot of different countries that are over there, but that's generally the area, Southwest Asia and what we would call the Middle East. So more locally, you can see some pictures here um, of what ancient Mesopotamia might have looked like. And the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, because they originate in the north and then flow to the south, they provided lots of really great water for irrigation and also lots of good minerals, uh, this fertile, silty soil, which you could grow uh, really good crops in. The region is otherwise doesn't have a lot of water, but from the river you would get water. The problem is, though, that the river flooded really unpredictably and sometimes violently and also often during the time of the year when their crops were just like getting started and wouldn't be able to survive that kind of thing. Um, and so you see that the geography resulted in this unpredictability being rooted in their life. And you can see, you know, these are some artist depictions of these things, but potentially some really beautiful buildings back then built with mud brick, which we'll talk more about in a minute. But the geography led to some social patterns. So they had unpredictable floods, and so their gods are pretty unpredictable. And Lil is one of their major gods, who I believe is the one depicted here. And they made sacrifices of material goods and animals to their many gods to keep them happy enough to not, you know, flood them to death. So polytheism is the worship of many gods, a pantheon of many gods. Uh, and you can see that here with their multiple gods. Now, most people lived in villages. And the larger villages got, the more they could have people specialize in labor and create agricultural surpluses uh, because they were working on larger farms. There was more efficiency in building those irrigation systems and using plows and things like that, like you can see down here. And so they had lots more food to go around and got bigger in terms of population. And then those uh, villages grew into cities. In cities, you had class systems. And these were organizations of society where some people had more power than others based on what they did. And those were slaves, farmers, merchants, artisans, you know, people who do crafts and stuff, warriors, priests, and rulers. And that goes from least power to most. Now, a comment on slavery, if you lost a war or were convicted of a crime or you went into debt, you could be enslaved. But it was not the most uh, common way of getting labor in this society. Peasants were the most common way of doing farm labor. Um, so here's some key political patterns. All these complex irrigation systems, because the rivers are so unpredictable, they required a lot of organization. And so centralized government developed here, meaning that the government that was at the you know heart of the city was the one that was making all the decisions from the very top. Not like everybody's kind of doing their own thing with a little bit of organization. No, no, no. Like from the very top, clear organization to, to make all this imp important agricultural stuff happen. Cities also developed more power over time as they extended their control over the surrounding villages. They basically offered protection in return for the villages sending them food and other goods. And the cities at first were ruled by priests, but then eventually by kings who created dynasties. So the priests we can tell were in power at first because in the archaeology uh, of these sites, you can see that the temples were in the center to begin with, but then later palaces kind of whoop, pushed them out of the center. Um, 
But the kings created these dynasties, meaning their families ruled down the line, and they passed power along hereditary lines, meaning it went from like father to son to son to son to son. Um, and the kings of this region, they represented the gods, but they were not themselves thought of as gods. They were, you know, just kind of repping the gods. Uh, the king's role was to organize agriculture and distribute resources, do all this centralized government stuff, lead armies, set up systems of laws like the Code of Hammurabi, who you can see here. This is the actual code itself, the little tiny bits of writing on there. It's a lot of writing, and it has all the different laws. And the thing about the laws during this time was, you know, the law codes had more severe punishments if you were further down the chain of power in society, which is very different than how we idealize our system to be today. Now, here's some key economic patterns. Uh, their main sources of food were, you know, barley, and there were a variety of veggies, fish, milk, sheep, and goat meat. Um, and you can see that they had this diversity of options for food sources, and that helped with the stability, even in the face of, you know, unpredictable floods. But the irrigation they used and the plows and other technologies, they were, you know, comparatively expensive to use and organize, but they produced all this agricultural surplus and there was no money back then. So like food was basically money. Um, and they traded that food and also cloth that they made for lumber and copper and tin, which you need to make bronze, which you can see here is used in weapons and lots of other uh, useful implements. And the buildings that they had were made from mud brick. So it was actually really cheap to build buildings compared to other tasks because you could build it out of the local materials. They had a lot of uh, clay-based mud to go around, so that was pretty easy. Um, and at first, temples controlled the trade. That seems to, to be what we understand about how trade worked back then. But, but over time, merchants and the whole merchant class rose over time, uh, developed you know merchant guilds and organizations of them, and, and they really took a lot of power. So it was the king, merchants, and priests all sharing power in this system. So here we're going to talk about their writing system first. Uh, now, they started with these pictograms. See, they're, they're basically just little pictures of exactly what you're talking about. But then over time, you can see they develop into these really abstract forms. But those abstract forms were really easy to make by pressing a little tool against a like mud, like clay tablet. And then you could put that in the fire and it would get hardened and you could keep it for long periods of time. So you can see it was, it was really a, uh, a transition of ease of use over time, which is pretty cool. So those pictograms develop into cuneiform, which you can see right here, was first developed in Sumerian for that language, but later adapted to other languages. And it means wedge shaped, just like you can see here. And here's the last thing we're gonna talk about, which is what these people left behind both archaeologically and in terms of ideas. First of all, astronomy and astrology. Astronomy is the study of the stars, and astrology is thinking about what, how those stars might influence you in sort of magical ways. They definitely developed those things. They also came up with the base 60 system that we use for our time, like minutes and seconds, uh, which is pretty cool. And also our system for you know measuring circles, the 360 degrees around a circle. Uh, we also use these for years. We, we use lots of different elements of their mathematics today. Um, but the thing is, we are missing important stuff from this time period. We have very, very little evidence of what life was like for peasants and what they thought and what they believed. And we also are missing a lot of women's voices because the Sumerian society became very, very male dominated. And they're the ones who left records behind because they wrote stuff down. So it's important to consider both what we know about Mesopotamia and what we don't. I hope you've enjoyed this video and I hope you have a great day. Bye.